get everybody, uh, all the reporters coming in here. You all set up? Squeeze in. Everybody ready to go? Okay. Okay, so we're, we're pretty much on time. It's 11 3 so we're starting pretty much on time. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, my name is Ray Lutz with Citizens Oversight, and we're here today to talk about a ruling that we got from the court uh, regarding our court case uh, uh, against Michael Vu, the Registrar of Voters in San Diego. Um, so uh, this, first I'm going to cover the details about that case, and then we're going to go into an overview of what we're going to do next and how to implement the results of this case uh, pretty much everywhere in the country that we can. Um, the, the, case is, the, the case itself was about the audit uh, that was supposed to be conducted after or during the time when they're counting all the ballots of the election. And they call it a 1% manual tally. In general, it's an audit. Not all states do it 1%. Uh, and what this audit is supposed to be, like most audits, it's supposed to be a random selection of these 1% of the election of the, of the precincts or batches of, of ballots. And then they manually or count those and check that the computer result uh, matches what the, the ballots actually have on them and check out any variances that there might be. Uh, for the last few years, Citizens Oversight has been pursuing a protocol or methodology for providing oversight to the registrar of voters that we call the snapshot protocol. And in this protocol, what, what uh, or this method, what we do is we look very, very carefully at what the registrar is doing during the audit. And this is what really prompted us to understand the fact that this registrar and many of the registrars in the state of California are not including a large percentage of the ballots in their audit. And that was basically the reason for the case. Um, it turns out that there's really four classes of, of uh, ballots that come in. The ones that are executed and cast at the polling place, the physical places you might go in and, and, uh, and yourself and, and cast your ballot in person, those are called polls ballots. There's the vote by mail ballots that were uh, cast fairly early in the election. You can send them in early and they start counting them 10 days in advance of the actual election day. And a lot of those are processed by election day. In fact, those are the results that you first see at 8 o'clock. And then there's the later arrival vote by mails. And then finally the provisionals. And those two sets of ballots were being excluded by this registrar to the tune of 285,000 ballots. About 37% of the ballots being counted were being left out of the audit. It would be kind of like the IRS saying, oh, we're going to audit you, but by the way, we're going to leave out um, the first part of the year. Guess where you're going to hide all of your bad stuff in the first part of the year? And then if they also say, well, we're going to only sample a few places, but we're going to tell you in advance what they are, then there's no surprise at all. I guarantee that you're going to make it through the audit. A lot of the counties are doing it that way. They're actually picking the 1% in advance. This, one, this uh, auditor here, this uh, registrar is not quite that bad, but it's something we're, we're pursuing. So we filed this case as soon as we found out that they weren't including these in the audit during the month after the election. Uh, we tried to get the uh, registrar not to certify at all. We wanted him to not certify the election unless he followed the law. Uh, because the law states all ballots cast would be included in the audit. It, not not following the law. Um, what we're worried about, of course, is that there's there could be massive election fraud in those portions of the ballot count that are not being audited. If they know which areas they are, they might fix those areas and get the election to come out any way they want. So basically, uh, there was two parts of this case. One was to say stop. Put the brakes on, do not certify unless you do it correctly. And the other part was, uh, we don't want this ever to be done this way, you know, in the future. Unfortunately, the, the judge was unable to, um, to stop them in their tracks because it was taking too long. But he did say in the ruling that they would have stopped them had we had enough time. Because they said that we were likely to prevail in our case. 
The second part, it has to do with uh, the future and if they are going to uh, do this in the future. Basically, in this uh, ruling, they said a few things that are important. Number one, it said, quote, plaintiffs provide evidence, that's where the plaintiffs, uh, that the defendants are not complying with the elections code by failing to include all ballots cast in 1% of the precincts chosen at random. <coughs> Specifically, plaintiffs, that's us, demonstrate that the defendants are in violation of the statute by one, not including any provisional ballots in the audit, and two, not including all vote by mail ballots. So he's agreeing with us that we provided enough evidence to show that this register our voters is in violation of the law. Exactly what we asserted halfway through the election process and we asked him very clearly, do what you're supposed to do. And he said, no, courteously or with respect, like that helps. The other thing that we have here is um, they said, in reviewing the legislative intent and explicit text of the law, there is a reasonable probability that the plaintiffs will prevail. This is great. So basically they're saying that we won, or we will win when we continue our case. So the county is on notice that we're gonna, we're gonna be able to do this. Now they threw out their various uh, rationale for not doing it. One of them said it was gonna take too long too many man hours. And the other one was it's prudent not to do it. Prudent not to do the whole thing. Well, both of those are just, uh, and the other one was all the other, many other counties are also violating the law. Yeah. And that, that was funny. Uh, of course, the, uh, the judge just cast those out without much of any, any discussion. Here's the most important thing. <clears throat> he said, the San Diego County Registrar of Voters has a legal obligation to comply with section 15360. It is imperative that auditing requirements are followed completely in order to ensure the continued public confidence in election results. The San Diego County Registrar of Voters is obligated to allocate its resources appropriately in order to comply with the law. If defendants are unable to do so, that's the county, they must seek redress with the legislative or executive branches of government, not the court. Basically, it was embarrassing watching this county go into this court and try to say that they were, it was okay for them to violate this law. You know, this year with all of the issues with the elections, and you've got this happening, you've got a, a registrar of voters and all, pretty much all the registrar voters in the state of California cutting corners and not doing everything that they're supposed to do to ensure that our elections are, are done correctly. So that's pretty much what he said. And I'd like to introduce now um, the attorney that's helping me with this, uh, Alan Garossi, who will now tell us uh, what, what, uh, what's gonna happen with this case next, Alan? Good morning. My name is Alan Gerasi. I'm an attorney here in San Diego County. I've been practicing for over 35 years. And I'm very interested in this case uh, because one thing I've learned over the many years I've been practicing is that a law is useless unless there is an enforcement value to it. And Ray and Citizens Oversight has now provided us the citizens of this county with an enforcement vehicle uh, to make sure that the registrar of voters is doing his job. And I learned about basically election integrity back during the earlier election cycles. The most, the most familiar is the 2000 and 2004 election cycles where we saw all sorts of shenanigans going on across the state, across the country, in various states, and we saw an election tilt one way or another because of the shenanigans. Well, I read a lot about what happened. I read about uh, how we 
what we can do as citizens to stop uh, these kinds of things from happening. And I was rather excited to learn that in California we had this audit process because that is a tool. That is our only tool uh, to make sure that the elections are properly administered and if they're not properly administered to give the citizens a remedy. And in this case, uh, we went to court, we asked the judge to please stop uh, this registrar from certifying the election until the audit was done properly. Unfortunately, the judge could not attend to the case soon enough to affect this past primary election cycle. However, he recognized that there was a very important value for him to give his preliminary thoughts uh, as to what the evidence is and what he sees uh, as a judge, where he sees this case going in the future. And he gave us a rather explicit uh, opinion, preliminary opinion, about how this case will proceed. The next stage of the case will be discovery, which is basically taking depositions, getting documents, sort of getting to the nitty gritty of the case, and then ultimately to a trial where the judge will hear the evidence on the witness stand and, and the form of documents uh, presented and will make a final determination of the case. Between now and then, there's opportunities for the parties to meet, to discuss, to try to resolve the case. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that can happen here, that the county, with, these, with this preliminary ruling, will see that there's value into resolving the case uh, by agreement, or what we call stipulation, uh, rather than going all the way through a trial. Uh, I think Mr. Lutz and Citizens Oversight has done a magnificent job of bringing this tool to the forefront, not only for San Diego, but for all the counties in California. We know of at least six, seven, or eight other counties that are uh, improperly conducting the audit, and we anticipate that we'll be uh, either filing or doing, taking whatever action we can to make sure that statewide the election audit is properly administered. Uh, with that, I'm happy to entertain uh, any questions uh, that any person in the media has. Whether it goes through a trial or you uh, come to terms through a stipulation, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is enforcement of the statute and proper enforcement of the statute. Uh, this particular registrar was, was caught short-sighted on how he was handling the audit, and uh, Mr. Lutz and Citizens Oversight caught him and stopped it in its tracks so that it doesn't happen again. Do we think that this will be resolved by uh, November? That is my job and my goal. I, I'm going to be working very hard uh, with the court and with the uh, county to get this matter resolved before the election cycle in November so that we, we are sure and certain that the audit is properly administered. Do we have any scheduled hearings yet? Uh, the next thing that will happen is what we call a case management conference. That will probably happen in the next 30 days. Uh, I will have discussions with the chief county counsel who is assigned this case and we'll try to resolve the case before that time. What is the what is the uh, cash award the county could be looking at in terms uh, of what the penalty would be? The, the case isn't about money. I'm just, about I'm just asking what could the county be on the hook for? The county could be on the hook for attorney's fees. Which would be? Costs. At this point, it's it's you know maybe ten or fifteen thousand okay. uh, dollars. But it could be a lot higher if we go all the way through trial. So uh, we're not we're not in this for a cash award of mm -hmm. uh, damages or to penalize the county <coughs> monetarily. We're looking for election integrity and enforcement. You said six, seven, or eight other counties are doing this. Do you know? Can you give me the the, the counties that are involved in that? I'll yield to Mr. Yeah. Lutz on that. We we received during the preliminary cycle declarations from registrars of other counties who basically were, were saying, well, we do the same thing as, as Mr. Vu, so it must be okay. And so that's how we know they're, they're not properly administered. That, that's in, the, that's in the, uh, the, the county's response to uh, their, their filing in response to our, our complaint. Uh, they got, uh, as evidence, a number of declarations from the, those other counties that they said, yeah, we're, we're violating the law too. 
<laughs> and therefore it must be okay to violate the law. This is kind of bad reasoning that we're seeing in play here. Um, and basically, before this press conference, we sent out um, letters to the top uh, two dozen counties in San Diego. Um, yeah, in California. So the ones that they yeah, here's actually the ones that they listed on their case: uh, Los Angeles, Orange County, Contra Costa County, Sacramento, Sonoma, Kern, uh, and Santa Cruz. Those counties all submitted declarations saying that we also violate the law. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, Michael, a question? So, in total, how many um, possible votes were unsupervised or un uninspected so that we could know potentially if the election sh might have swayed one way or the other? Well, yes. Uh, in, in this county, there was 285,000 ballots that were not audited. Um, certainly within, uh, for example, the Bernie versus Hillary race was only separated by 16,000 ballots. So it would be very, very easy to conceal 16,000 uh, votes within 285,000 votes that you didn't audit. Mm -hmm. um, so it pretty much you could swing the election as much as you want. This whole election could be completely upside down because they haven't done their audits. And it makes you wonder, why are they dragging their feet so hard? Why does it take them that we have to take him to court? Because I asked mm -hmm. Michael Vu to correct his, his action mm -hmm. in the, right away. He could have actually done it during the month of counting and says, okay, yeah, you're right. We'll make sure that we follow the law. Instead, they say, no, we're going to continue to violate the law knowingly, along with these other counties that are knowingly violating the law. How many other laws are they knowingly violating? Okay, that's what I want to know. How many other laws are these guys knowingly violating? Because if they're violating this law, which we caught them on, how much other crap is going on here? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm worried about because this election could be completely flipped around because of this, this kind of attitude. Um, how do you know that they are interpreting themselves as a violation of the law and choosing to deliberately violate? We're, 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 how did you reach that conclusion? They were aware that they were in violation ahead of your suit. Well, because and they, that they chose to violate. They had no uh, argument at all in their response, saying that it was okay for them not to count the rest of the vote by mail ballots, especially. That's explicitly stated in the law. But that doesn't mean that they were in, that, that they were knowingly in violation. It doesn't say in the election code it's okay not to count them if you don't have enough money or time. It doesn't right. say you can not count them if other counties are not counting. It doesn't say you can not count them if you think it's a prudent business decision not to count them. Those are the arguments that they made. No time, prudent business decision. Other counties are also doing it. Now, what, where in there is, a, is the argument that says that we can do it? That's what I don't see. Uh, where's the argument that shows that they believe that they were in violation? I'm asking where did they concede that they were in violation? Well, no one, you ask any attorney, uh, did you violate the law? They'll say no. So how do you know that they uh, believe that they were in violation of the of anyways? Here's what we believe the judge just said, <laughs> that they're in violation. <laughs> what else more do you want? But you said that they, that you, you said that they, the judge that said they knew they were in violation. It doesn't matter anymore what they said. The judge says it. Okay, so I'm saying that you don't have anything before that where they can see that before this ruling that they were in violation of the law. They knew that they weren't fulfilling the law. Where did you reach that conclusion? I asked Michael Vu to count all of the ballots. He said, respectfully, I declined to do so. Where did you, I know, but where did you see, where do you have knowledge of them saying, yes, we know that we are in violation of the law, and we are, we are choosing to violate? Okay, Alan, why don't you try to handle that one? I, you know, it, it's rather simple. They, by way of, before the lawsuit was filed, declined to do the full audit. We filed the lawsuit. Then they responded to the lawsuit by simply stating that they didn't have to fully comply, that their substantial compliance was enough. Now the judge has spoken, at least preliminarily, saying, no, your substantial compliance, even if it's true, is not enough. You must fully comply with the full spirit and intent of the legislature. Okay, so they believe that there was substantial they did believe that. that. Okay. Mr. Lutz, do you, a couple questions. Do you think this is more of a statewide push or 
do you, do you sense that this had a, a big impact on local elections as well? And, okay. and do you think that this has gone, is it specifically just for this election or has it, has, do you, have you no, found this, any evidence? This, this, is a, this is a habit of these guys, it's been happening for many elections. Uh, unless the public, uh, organizations and citizens come forward and watch very, very carefully what's going on with their election officials, they start to cut corners. They start to say, well, we can save a little bit of money because no one is watching this. And so why, why do it the right way? Uh, in fact, we may have to do more work if we actually catch something. So in 2004, Michael Vu actually pre-selected pre his precincts to, to use in the audit so that they would match. And so he says, well, we don't want to, and they argued the reason that they did that, they didn't want to have to do the extra work if they happened to not match. Now, many other states in California are pre-selecting their precincts that they're going to be auditing before the election, maybe two months, two months ahead of time. If you do that, the whole thing is a sham. Uh, anybody who knows what those precincts are can fix the election at will, and they'll never be caught because they know what the, the audited precincts are. Uh, in terms of the implications, this could this could impact uh, not only San Diego County because, as I, as we said, San Diego is a very it could also impact just if, this is the only one a very big county in in California in terms of number of voters. It's number two. There's Los Angeles, then San Diego, then Orange County. Those three account for 50% of the voters in California. If you take the next uh, dozen, which is uh, then Riverside, Alameda, Santa Clara, San Bernardino, Sacramento, Contra Costa, San Francisco, Fresno, and Ventura, that's 76% of the votes. And the next dozen, San Mateo, Kern, San Joaquin, Sonoma, Stanislaus, Plosser, Solano, Santa Barbara, Monterey, San Luis Obispo, Marin, and Santa Cruz. That's leaving out the other 34 counties. So we're only up to 24. That's 92% of the voters in California. So we're gonna be focusing on these counties. And what we're actually in the second part of this uh, presentation, if you will, I'll just move into it now, is that uh, the larger implications is that we want to ask the citizens of California and the rest of the country to work with us to uh, preserve our democracy. This is where we really can't rely upon any elected official to do it for us. We have to be the ones that watch this registrar of voters and how they do it. Uh, the media doesn't do it to this level because it's too much work to go in there and, and do it. The citizens have to go in and watch in very careful detail. Now, Citizens Oversight developed, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, it's just a little quick flash here, of a process which is called the Snapshot Protocol, which we're going to be training um, citizens around the state and the country to be involved in watching these audits according to this protocol uh, procedure. And if we follow this Snapshot Protocol, then uh, these audits will be um, able to catch uh, malfeasance and therefore it will give us a sense of uh, a much better um, feeling about what these guys are doing here. Because right now there's a lot of talk about, well, we're not sure if the election was rigged. Well, you know, those feelings are well founded with this type of attitude that this registrar has been displaying. Well founded. All those concerns are well founded that that uh, it looks like the top two to dirty dozen, top two dirty dozen in, in California are also violating the law. Across the country, there's many states that are not even doing an audit, but we're looking for uh, the top 24 states to be involved in this especially. Now, California is the biggest state in terms of number of voters in the nation. Next is Texas, and then I'll list them, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, New Jersey. Those top dozen account for 50% of the votes in the nation. Then Washington, Massachusetts, Missouri, Tennessee, Indiana, Wisconsin, Maryland, Minnesota, Arizona, Colorado, South Carolina, and Louisiana. The next dozen combined, that's a, uh, almost a, a little over 80% of the voters. So we're going to concentrate on those states. We're not going to leave anybody out. If they want to be involved, by all means, contact us. 
Go to Citizens Oversight slash sign up and sign up and we'll put you guys in teams so that, and train you on how to do this sort of oversight so that you can take part and we can get our country uh, off of this bad course of elections that can't be trusted. What's the, uh, yeah, okay, uh, first here, go ahead. What's the variation between uh, national and various state election laws? How do you uh, create um, you know, some sort of uniform or uh, how do you resolve the discrepancies there? To Okay, that's a good question. There are many discrepancies because every single state is its own little fiefdom. However, uh, many states do have even more robust uh, post-election audits than California. New York is one where they do 3%, and we're only doing 1%. Um, so, but other states like Arizona, they only do a few races. They pick a few races at random and then only 1% of those few races. And then they're not a public process, and there's a lot of problems with it. So um, there is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of dis you know, discrepancies between the states, uh, and uh, we're just going to do our best to deal with that and try to, to also push for legislation within those states to try to harmonize uh, and eliminate some of the loose ends that, that, that we have where some of these states can conduct unreliable elections. <laughs> Uh, I don't have that at my fingertips. There are some states that are really, really good. Um, actually, there's some counties within California that are really, really good. Humboldt County does a great job. Some of them have been extremely responsive uh, and, and cooperative, whereas other states, other counties, have been basically uncooperative. San Bernardino basically said, well, we're not going to cooperate at all. We're not interested in cooperating. Well, you know, we're going to have to proceed with them and get volunteers in that area to uh, to twist arms and go in there and make sure that they're cooperating because mm -hmm. this is what uh, uh, you know what it's going to take probably is that those teams on a, on a boots on the ground level those teams in there and trying to get those things on a on a minute by minute basis. One of the issues is we we require that we get the snapshot file at a certain time. We need the snapshot file to come out of the registrar and in our hands and a third party's hands and secure before they do the 1% manual tally selection. We don't want them selecting any random precincts until we've got this secured and frozen. Otherwise, you just go back in and change the computer result and fix everything up and you never catch anything. Um, so Fresno is an example of a, a county where they choose an imperial. They choose their uh, precincts in advance, which makes the whole thing just a big joke. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. No, I just wanted to reiterate that throughout the country that there's different laws. Oh, yeah. In California, you're using a specific law to be able to double check the vote, but in other states, they do not have such laws. Well, they, there's a lot of them that do. It's, mm -hmm. um, there's a site uh, online that, that, uh, that it's called, it's the Minnesota of Voter Rights. I don't know why Minnesota gets this, but Minnesota is one on the forefront. And they have a whole site that details every single state and what their laws are and how they how they measure up. Mm. Uh, but we, we're going to be generating a, a best practices uh, for how these audits are to be performed, so that we can go in and, in there and see, gee, are they are they meeting the best practices of what they should be doing in our view? Uh, because there isn't. And unfortunately, the Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, has been completely sitting on his hands on this. He has been defeating the efforts of uh, um, the, uh, those concerned about election integrity from actually completing their work. Another concern that we've brought up, people wanting to contest the election don't have time when they have these conventions that happen immediately. Where is the time to actually go to court if something happens? They say, well, it's already done. Hillary Clinton has been nominated. Donald Trump has been nominated. Well, wait a second. We haven't even finished talking about this malfeasance going on here in the Registrar of Voters. Maybe it isn't true that Hillary Clinton won. Maybe Bernie Sanders won in California. And that would really change things. Because with 285,000 votes up in the air, and we are not sure how those really fell down, we heard about also waiting out ballots changing the marking on ballots and um, other things that we're very concerned about. How, do you, how can you do that? Those ballots are supposed to be sacred. You shouldn't be changing them or whiting them out without 
oversight, checks and balances to make sure that it's done properly. That's not being done here. I asked him, is there any checks and balances? He says no. You just have to trust the people doing it. Okay, so I'd like to encourage people before we move on to other speakers uh, to go to citizensoversight.org slash sign up and sign up there for your district and tell us where you are so that we can chew in teams and for November we have less than 100 days here to coordinate plus we have to start in advance of the election because of the vote, uh, vote by mail ballots that have to be coming out we have to be watching as those are brought in as what they're doing with them and how they're counting them. So we need to be in there at least 30 days, but at a minimum 10 days before the election. We have to be have our teams to play and trained to, uh, to watch. Uh, what's yes. your take on Trump's statement from the other day that uh, the election is uh, likely to be rigged? Well, I think he's right. Um, I think Donald Trump is right on this. Uh, uh, the elections, as we're seeing here, have been rigged. Uh, at least to the extent where the registrar of voters is looking the other way, not doing their full job. And if somebody wanted to hack in there and change it, we talking about hackers from Russia and so forth uh, getting into the DNC and all this computer stuff. Hey, guess what? With 285,000 votes out, they could have done a lot of uh, a lot of damage. Um, so there are other aspects, not just with regard to that type of changes. All these are aspects with regard to the provisional votes coming in, and it was just a complete mess. And they've been jury rigging and, and gaming the system for years. They've been trying to make it hard to register, hard to get to the polls, hard to get, get your vote counted. Everything's difficult. And they figure, well, if we make it difficult, it'll be easier for us to win. Now, for Donald Trump, I don't know how that would work out for him, but I think his statements is in regard to Bernie Sanders. And a lot of the Bernie Sanders supporters are are feeling the same way. They and we we saw it also in that uh, the early vote by mail ballots, the ones that came in first. Hillary uh, Hillary Clinton won by 58 to 42 percent, but in the polls ballots, people that actually went to the polling places, it was the other way around. 58 uh, 8 percent for Bernie and only 42 for Hillary. He won. The trouble with those early vote by mail is, unfortunately, citizens oversight, we fell down on the job here. We weren't in this registrar of voters 10 days before the election watching what they were doing. I myself watched them mark ballots with a marker in the back. I said to the guy, Why, what are you doing? Is there any checks and balances? How do we know they're doing the right thing they're marking here? He said, well, you just trust them because they've been working here a long time. That's not enough. It's not enough just to trust people that happen to work there a long time. In fact, I trust them even less. Uh, <laughs> you know, I want some check and balance of two people there, an outsider coming in to watch it, a team of people, maybe a board, a review panel. There's other ways to do it other than just trust the person because they've worked there a long time. So uh, there are many concerns other than what we were able to put into this lawsuit. This lawsuit was very, very specific on a specific violation that we knew this registrar was doing. Absolutely in violation, and they would just said, no, we're not gonna follow the law. Well, in that case, we're taking it to court, pal. You've gotta follow the law, or else we're gonna have the court demand that you do so. I think this guy, Michael Lou, should be out on his butt. He does not deserve to be in office here if he violates the law like this. Not at all. Uh, yes. Why do you think it would have changed the outcome of the Democratic primary? I mean, the Associated Press voted for uh, Clinton on Monday, November 6th. I mean, California yeah. at that point was largely, in terms of like, uh, delegate count, was irrelevant. Now, the problem is is that they called this, this election long before any of the ballots had even been counted. They yeah. called it on election night uh, when those first vote-by-mail ballots came in. That were, but California was irrelevant as of the, the Democratic California primary. is never <laughs> irrelevant. California has the most voters in the nation. Well, it was already it was already determined at that point. No. I mean, it's already a, a no, no. So why would it that have mathematically changed the outcome? First of all, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging your claim that it would have changed the outcome of the Democratic primary. Uh, that's not something that I'm really going to weigh in on. Make this claim. You need to back it up. No, no. My claim, my claim is, my claim is, Daniel, Daniel. 
my, my claim is that California may have been flipped in this election. That's my claim. That's my claim. Now, how that impacts what they do at the convention and what, how they count out their votes and so forth, that's all something we could not predict. Because had Bernie Sanders won California and they, they either they didn't announce it incorrectly right away, they actually audit all the, they say it flipped on, on June 7th. Bernie Sanders would have been able to court those other uh, super delegates and we would have seen a different convention. Different. Now, I can't predict what the results would be, nor can anyone else. But I think that it's only, we're only doing our job if we make sure that those ballots are counted correctly and we get our audit done correctly so we know what the outcome is going to be. Not say, oh, it's okay for the election to have been done poorly because the result was not an issue. That never should be the argument, and I will never allow that. The, these, these, all these ballots should be counted, and they should not be put under the guise of California is meaningless, your vote is meaningless because they've already decided it. Those are all bad policies anyway. Now, uh, any questions from the media for me yes well, I had a question on Facebook live Ray okay Facebook live. Um, right. somebody asked about uh, the shredding of the ballots how that's going to be addressed okay well the shredding of ballots we uh, got that information because we saw the shredding truck out in front of the registrar voters one day when we had our press conference it happened to be caught with some of the pictures in the background we asked them why you had a shredding truck there Michael Vu uh, said he's not shredding anything Unfortunately, the trustworthiness of Michael at this point is is not 100%. So we, we still are looking into that. We're trying to find out and get, we've asked for the manifest of materials. What was shredded? Was it from this election or another election? But, you know, basically, it's just a bad idea to have a shredding truck drive up to the registrar voters during the time when you're counting the ballots. <laughs> it's yeah. just a bad idea. So, you know, the county should strive to avoid driving shredding trucks up to the to the registrar voters in the future. Uh, I, whether we get to the bottom of what was shredded, uh, it's very hard because those shredding companies uh, pride themselves on security and no one ever knowing what what was shredded and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna we're gonna look into that, and if we continue with this case, I mean, we're looking forward to these depositions. We're looking forward to having Michael Vu have to testify. We're looking forward to interviewing all of those people in there mm -hmm. and finding out exactly what went on during this time. And we're going to, we, I think we may not want to uh, negotiate with them and just go forward with trial and go through with these depositions. And that's why it would be great if we could get uh, a, a plea here. I'm going to need to ask for donations from the public watching this so that we can fund this sort of legal activity. Uh, because I, I'd rather have go through that in addition I want to ask Michael Vu to complete the audit at mm -hmm. least take in those rest of those ballots that he did not audit the first time and finish it right. or restart the audit from the beginning and do it all maybe hire an outside firm to do the audit and they say they can do it for cheaper and he says he it's going to cost him to do these last, last few he said a hundred thousand dollars to count two thousand eight hundred and fifty ballots that's thirty-five dollars a ballot. Wow! I, anybody can do it for less than that. I don't know where he's coming up that number. Does the law allow for a contracted outside auditor? Yes. Okay. Uh, I talked to an outside audit firm. They specialize in, in elections. Uh, they come in with a thing and they scan all the ballots and, and photograph every single one. They have ex exceptionally sophisticated scanners and, and diagnostic machines, way beyond they use here, and they will do a audit of the entire election, 100 percent of the ballots for less than what he says it'll cost to do the rest that's legal in california it, it is legal to do the audit that way not uh, any audit not and will it be legally binding and satisfy the requirements of statute that's going to be something that we can negotiate i don't think they can use that in their uh in their future elections in terms of doing the manual tally because that is specific manual tally. Register the voters. but it would be good manual. if they could i think it'd be better to use an outside firm to do the audit because then you got a you got an outside check going on instead of insiders. I got you, but it's not like you know when they have to do the, the audit, they could theoretically from this point forward contract it out and it would be in compliance with law. I don't think that that's compliant at this point, okay. but it's I something we can investigate. Now, any more questions on this aspect from the media up here or anywhere else? Okay, now what I got.
would like to ask is if Dewana uh, would like to say some things. This is Dewana Bing. She is an attorney. She's working on some other cases. Can you give us the update on that? Dewana? Thank you. As Ray said, my name is Dewana Bain. I've been working with Ray Lights and Citizens Oversight in Del Simbich up in Northern California on San Diego County's lawsuits and also in San Bernardino County. And we are concerned about what happened to the votes all over the state of California. Michael Boo is the epicenter of what went wrong in California. But I have something to say to the reporter that was just being with Ray Lutz. You, sir, when you called California irrelevant, I say no state in this nation is irrelevant. And mm -hmm. I am a person who was born and raised in California. This is my state. This is the biggest state in this nation. Don't you dare call this state irrelevant. <laughs> All right. Take a breath here. <laughs> we are still trying to figure out what happened to your votes, California. All right? Now, no one thus far can tell us. Michael Vu certainly cannot tell us. And this ruling by the judge that says that Michael Vu and the Registrar of Voters did not properly audit the votes. Again, that, that dovetails directly into what we were talking about with this election contest, where we said that Michael Vu committed misconduct because, among other things, he failed to properly audit the votes by not counting the provisional ballots and the late vote-by-mail ballots. Some of the other things that we believe that Michael Vu did wrong, or the registrar's office that is overseen by Michael Vu did wrong, is failed to count the college student votes. We are aware that a number of college students cast votes. Those votes were put into provisional envelopes. We don't know what happened to them, but we believe that a number of those votes were set aside. We don't know how many of those votes, but San Diego County is a very big county. We know that it happened at least at San Diego State University. Michael Liu believes that at San Diego State University, the students who live on campus should have their votes put into provisional envelopes for some reason. We're still trying to sort that out. And we're still trying to sort out what happened to the votes on the other end. We do know that the San Diego Registrar's Office has a giant warehouse of some sort. So we're very concerned about the custody of these ballots and what happens. Mm -hmm. We understand that these votes are dropped off or were dropped off at this warehouse. We don't know who oversees those ballots. We're very concerned about the custody of those ballots. Uh, of course, there was a great amount of confusion with no party preference voters. So in a mm -hmm. county where the difference was, what was it, 16,000 votes? Between, sorry, between, yeah, that was the final difference between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. So there's a very small number of votes separating the two candidates in the presidential primary. And at this point, it's very hard to determine who the actual winner was in San Diego County. But there's enough evidence of misconduct and misplaced votes and lost votes that it is believed of many people in this county, including me, that Bernie Sanders was the probable winner. Mm -hmm. We're going to find out. We won't stop until we find out what happened to your vote. We won't stop. And I just wanted to add that uh, I agree with Mr. Let's hear. You know, Helen Robbins Meyer, Michael Vu's boss, said after listening to voter after voter, at the San Diego County Board of Supervisors meeting, say, hey, there was whiteout used on our votes. You know, all kinds of hell broke loose on election day, and they wouldn't let us observe what happened. But we know that mm -hmm. our votes were whited out. Helen Robbins Meyer said, our registrar is not a criminal. He is one of the finest registrars in the county. We stand behind him 100%. Okay, well, they're going to stand behind him 100% as we continue this lawsuit and as Alan Jirachi continues his lawsuit, as we find out what happens to those votes. I hope that the county is proud that they have stood behind this, quote, finest registrar in the county. 
country. Oh, I'm sorry, in the country. That's right. That's right. This finest registrar is the same registrar, I would like to remind you, that was run out of Ohio mm -hmm. because his employees were caught for election related crimes. So forgive me if I don't have a lot of faith in the integrity of this registrar. But when our votes are at stake, we take for granted that we go in and we vote and that our votes matter. And we don't even know what happened to these votes. I am very, very concerned about the way that the county is standing this for this Thank you. for those comments. Uh, I just want to close now with a couple final remarks about uh, the future of this. Again, we want to uh, reach out to those citizens that are also similarly concerned about how our elections are being run. And Please come to our website, citizensoversight.org slash sign up. Sign up uh, on the site. Tell us where you are, which election district you're in, so we can get you started and train you about how you can provide the similar oversight and catch the stuff going on in your area. Because it's going to be different in every area. But these register these election of election officials are all basically out of control. They're all out of control. Uh, also, I'd like to remind you that not all of these activist groups that are that are doing, uh, you know, election integrity activism are legitimate. Uh, some of them are working on things like voter fraud, which is a, a somewhat of a hoax, uh, very much hoax. And so, watch where you're you're sending your money. Of course, we'll take it. Go to citizensoversight.org/donate. At least you know that we are the organization that's actually pursuing these bad boys here with our lawsuit and, and taking the task. So uh, that's my last comment. Any <laughs> final questions from anyone in the crowd? Yeah. Yes, um, sir. I, I looked at 63 polls for the primary and uh, Clinton won uh, 60 of them. Why do you think that the election would have, the results did not reflect uh, everything that was going on? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I can't really talk to the polls. I do know that, that uh, there was a I, I could look very simply at the crowds. You look at the crowds for Bernie Sanders, you had 25, 30,000 people. Hillary Clinton could barely draw, uh, fill up a gymnasium. Uh, you had people coming to our polling places. I talked to the polling workers who said 80% of the people coming in were voting for Bernie Sanders. They were first time voters. They were coming in to vote and they didn't know what to do and so forth. They had to have provisionals. Maybe they got their signature or whatever wrong. And, these things were all filtered out, unfortunately. And what is amazing here, and this is I've never seen before, is that the vote by mail ballots are so different. The first vote by mails had Hillary Clinton winning by 40 points, and then it flipped. The actual votes from the polling places were Bernie Sanders winning by 40 points. I never see that. Here's the same people filling out a vote by mail ballot and putting it in the mail. Some of them were early and some were later. Why? Is it that the people happen to get it postmarked by the postmark date were so much different? That's the problem. Last one. For yes. Me. So I, you mentioned that uh, San Diego does not pre-select districts. I spoke to Mr. Workman. He said that there is a committee that does just that, actually. Well, so they, how they, they are. Uh, this is something that we have a concern: is that they don't. If you look at this picture here, we have a block of 40 by 40. That's 1,600 little blocks. This is all the precincts in San Diego. Those little blue ones are the ones that they chose this time. In the first round, they choose those publicly. But in the second round, they have to choose additional precincts to deal with additional races. They're choosing them in a back room, probably smoke-filled. You had said that they don't do that, though, and, and mentioned Fresno as a, as, a, as a county that does. So do they? do they? have a committee that picks these jurisdictions prior districts prior to the election? No, they, they're not picking it prior to the election, but the issue is whether it's a surprise to the people inside what they are. Mm -hmm. And the ones that they're picking in Fresno, they're choosing randomly before the election. And they're not doing it by committee, they're doing it by random draw of ping pong ball or something. But it's a random process, it's done publicly, 
but it's done in advance and then they publish it on their website. And if you're a hacker, you just go to the website and say, okay, I'm not going to modify those precincts. If you go in and modify the election, it will, and you can, you can change it as much as you want. 10, 20,000 votes. What you do is you go to the other yellow dots here, and you can change each one of those by 10 or 20 votes that's unnoticeable. And then you switch it by 10 or 20,000 votes in the end. Right. So you can flip a whole election by doing that. <coughs> okay, so yeah, that's something that is a little bit nuanced, the answer. It isn't just yes or no, because there's different aspects of choosing, different precinct types of precincts that you're choosing at what time. Fresno admits they're doing it two months ahead of the election. Imperial admits they're doing it all in front and ahead of the election. This registrar does it all after the election, but some of it internally, and we're not trusting. That's not what he told me. Okay, well. He told me that it was prior to the election. He said it was prior to the election. We'll, we'll work that out, because we yeah. actually participated in the drawing of them. Okay. Right. In terms of how the 1% is calculated, is it 1% of, I don't know, let's say if there's 1,000 reasons you have to be 10, or is it 1% of the 1% of voters? How is that 1% increased? Uh, is the it way it's defined is it's 1% of the precincts. So if they have 1,000 precincts, it'll be 10. In this county, they had 1,522 precincts. They chose 16. Okay. Then in addition, they had to choose additional, uh, additional races, additional uh, precincts, and additional races that they manually tally because they want to make sure that at least every race is involved. You want to talk? Come up here, though, Josephine. Come up here because we're on to you. When I was looking at the claims, and that, I read the definition. It said the definition of the 1% is of the original canvas. And right above that, the definition of original canvas says, including but not limited to votes by mail and provisional ballots. So when you say whether they were intentionally not counting them, their own definition says to include them. They chose for, not to. For provisional ballots, are they counted, say, you know, someone voted at precinct A, but they were supposed to count in precinct B? Are they counted in precinct A or B? Do we have to ask them that? The only thing I know is they weren't counted in the 1%. I'll try to answer that. I believe they were counted there in their home precincts. But they shouldn't be done. So that. would they be audited with their home precinct or in their um, their provisional precinct? Those are going to have to be probably re reselected. In other words, they're going to have to choose different precincts or process them in a different way. And there's another option for processing those batches. They can put them in batches that are not that are mixed precincts, and they can count those. But that's right. not the option that they use, though. They do the one percent. They started with that no, that one. They started choosing batches, and they switched partway through. So this is one of our big questions: Why the registrar started with one method and then changed halfway through? So this is this is a, a question that we have about as soon as we started asking them about the batches, because they chose batches in the first draw, and then we said, well, where are the data files for the batches that we want to check? And they're not choosing enough batches to account for the rest of them. Because I have layers here. The top layer is the polls ballots, and there's other three other layers. You choose these precincts, you got to also process the rest of these layers. And they were leaving out the last two layers completely. Uh, so if they're going to process these in a step-by-step in a -step mode, then they're not going to be able to choose these same precincts because then they're, they're known. They're not a surprise, and then they can manipulate those. So that's why we want to make sure that if they're doing batches, they say, okay, we're going to do a second step here. we got all these batches. Now we're going to do another public draw. We want it to be a public process where they draw it at random. So it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky because of all the details. But uh, we, are, we are now, we're getting closer to fully understanding what they're doing. But still, some of the things, we've asked them questions about why you chose batches, they don't have an answer. So maybe as a reporter, you can go in there and ask Michael Vu, why the hell did you choose batches in the first round if you're not using uh, no, option one, and instead you started using option two? How come, you're do how come you did that? And maybe as a reporter, you can get an answer from the guy, because we certainly haven't heard any answer. And so it would be nice to know. 